Hey guys, it's Jack. I just wanted to talk to you today about a way that you can help support the podcast. If you're not already, we would really appreciate it. If you guys went and reviewed us on Apple or Spotify, those reviews really help people find the podcast and help it get recognized. And, uh, you know, if you've been enjoying the show, we really appreciate your support. Another thing that you can do to support the channel is to become a Patreon member. So we have Patreon memberships that start at just $5 a month. And when you sign up, you get access to all of our episodes ad-free. Uh, that's the big bonus for that. I mean, we also do some Patreon bonus episodes for our subscribers. Uh, but this is the, the biggest and best way that you can support the Team House channel and podcast uh, if you'd like to. And we really appreciate that. So go in and check us out at patreon.com slash the team house. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Eyes On. I'm Andy Milburn. I'm Jason Lyons. I'm uh, Dimitri Tacos. Very excited for this today's show. Okay. We're, Dee, what are we, we, we're going to talk about a couple of things. First of all, the new format. We're keeping this uh, when we don't have a guest fairly uh fairly sharp on the on time to 30 40 minutes a uh, number of things happening in the news today the number one okay is the baltimore bridge and um investigating this particular incident has been our own jason lyons over to you jason <laughs> Thanks, yeah, that man. sounded pretty professional right <laughs> yeah, that sounded good <laughs> live on scene <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so good morning everyone okay, um check. For those who don't know, uh, on Monday, the 25th of March, at about zero uh, one thirty in the morning, a uh, Singapore registered ship called the Dolly, it's a approximately thousand foot container ship, uh, ran into the lost power and ran into part of the Francis Key Scott Scott Key Bridge in uh, Baltimore, Maryland, and uh, as soon as it hit the bridge, that portion of the bridge collapsed. Um, Reports are all over the place, but as far as I know, three folks were pulled from the water. Uh, six, between six to eight, are still missing. Uh, or I'm sorry, through uh, yeah, six are still missing. Six to eight, depending on the reports. Um, but the reason why we're talking about this now, some people may say, you know, why are we talking about this? This is not necessarily national security, but uh, it's a matter of misinformation, um, as far as I'm concerned. Um, so immediately reports were going across uh, X, former Twitter and other social media platforms that this was a terror attack, that it was a cyber attack, that it was or everything from that all the way to I saw someone, a, a well-known uh, reporter um, saying that this uh, blaming this on the current administration's open border policies. What? Not sure where the hell that thread came <laughs> from, um, but OK, uh, Oh, also uh, mask mandates that had something to do with it as well, too. So, um, yeah, I can, see so, the, I can see that link. Yeah, exactly. So misinformation is um, Hold on one second. Andy, oh. put your, put your, let's refocus your beautiful face. You want to oh. uh, put your palm over your camera and reach it out because you're out of focus. You're out of focus. Ah, oh. yeah. So I turn my uh, I never look at my own camera when nope. I'm doing this. Oh shit! Hey, just keep talking. No one, no one cares yeah. about my. All face. right, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, misinformation is um, inaccurate reporting or inaccurate information, uh, whereas disinformation is a purpose is purposely um, putting out uh, incorrect information or false or misleading information. So, the whole reason we're talking, I want to talk about this, is because that is a part of intelligence of the intelligence. Uh, community and apparatus uh getting at the end of the day you want to get accurate <clears throat> um information to the consumer the consumer has a question they want to know in this case what happened uh with this boat with this ship and why did it happen so i'll oh, go ahead wait, yeah quick question for you i mean where do these stories begin right i mean where where do all these uh, and and how do they gain traction? You know, these aren't they, these aren't just kind of scuttle what they are, but they they've been given the un, uh, undeserved attention of uh, of mainstream media, right? Yeah. That you know all all of these, and and yet there isn't a shred of evidence to suggest that. Am I right? Absolutely, yeah. So far, now of course, I never say never, especially 
working in in uh, the intelligence uh, world. It's you never say never. It could come out six months from now, two years from now, whatever. It really was a hack. It really was a terrorist attack. Um, but right now, the evidence does not point that way. And uh, I think to, to answer your question, the reason why and how it gains traction and gets life is uh, the the internet, social media. Uh, people are able to take a theory that they have or that someone who supports their theory has and just either spin it or throw it out there wholesale and nothing happens in a vacuum. So your theory, you know, as crazy as it might sound, may resonate with someone who has the same type of uh, thoughts and boom, it just grows from there. Like uh, I, I knew this was going to happen and I purposely looked for it Um on uh, I'm not on Twitter, but I was able to see some things. And I said, I'm guaranteeing you that if anyone's seen the video of the collapse, uh, you'll see flashes as it's going down. And I knew it was going to happen. And I found the video. I think I sent it to you guys last night. Someone is looking at the video and they're using their finger and a point. Look here, here and here. You can see the explosions of dynamite charges. They literally said dynamite charges like we're in an 1860s uh, coal mine or something somewhere, a gold mine. Um, you know, showing, oh, this was deliberate. And uh, uh, of course, someone came back on and said, they're an engineer and said, um, that thing is full of electrical wiring, that bridge. So when it's going down and those wires snap, that's what you're seeing. But they weren't hearing that. So um, I reached out to a friend of mine. Uh, he is Which, a, by the way, is how we do open source intelligence, right? You know, exactly. I mean, it, it's amazing how uh how, how much now can be learned from the internet and we've talked about open source intelligence and the fact that the most uh, prolific and effective analysts never leave never leave the open source information and absolutely and it can be used for disinformation too mm -hmm. right as you point yep. out yeah because the, the average person you know, only has yeah, open source and, so it's easy to get to them and and less than a year or so from now, what what would probably follow a case like this are YouTube real realistic looking YouTube videos that really make it look as though Baltimore Bridge was destroyed by sea drones or a mask wearing stranger or something. Absolutely, absolutely, and that's the yeah. the shit side of uh, of uh, social media and and technology. Period. Um, <clears throat> so I reached out to a, a friend of mine. Uh, I, and hopefully he's already offered to come on the show if this, you know, um, gets legs and it becomes more than what it, you know, appears to be at first. And so he pointed me to, first of all, I asked the question, um, could this have been a cyber attack, which is what a lot of people are saying. And his answer uh, is, I suppose, but I can think of 10 other scenarios that are more likely to have happened before <laughs> exactly. you get to cyber attack. Yeah. Uh, we just don't know what we don't know. And that last part is the most important mark part. It just happened. We don't know what we don't know yet. So um, let's give it a little time. And then I was, uh, I saw someone called the salty engineer. Uh, I'm not an expert on, on this stuff, maritime uh, uh, subjects, but he says when a ship loses power like that, the rudder will be locked in and whatever position it is in, at the time of the power loss, what you're seeing with the power loss is most likely an initial power failure, as well as a secondary power failure. The ball, Boat was also involved in an incident in a foreign port recently, which ports to, points to an ongoing issue, most likely due to either failure of management or severe lack of proper training. Again, yeah. I can't ship speak drivers, that. Ship drivers who cannot drive. It's exactly. Amazing. Yes. The, so the, the, the most simple explanation, but it's normally not it, good enough for you, for Joe Public, right? Has absolutely. So just before i step off my soapbox and and hurt my old back here i'm just gonna say it's we just don't know what we don't know so let's think about the lives that were lost let's think about how we can prevent this from happening again and until we have the facts let's just keep it as uh you know it's all speculation so over to you yeah yeah it's uh no that's i i, I just couldn't bring myself to to read that story because i knew it what was going to what was going to start churning up but thanks for that jason on the maritime on the maritime theme here um switch to the red sea and the reason why we're banging this drum a little bit you know isn't because we're a one trick red sea pony but because the severity of what is happening there we believe is perhaps not um not 
fully uh, appreciated. So, you know, on one hand, you have this incident, domestic incident, which gets blown up. And meanwhile, okay, over the weekend of the Red Sea, um, well, really Friday and Saturday, because it's, you know, we count Friday as, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's that part of the world is part of the weekend, right? Um, the, the fight, the, you know, the, the drone battle in the Red Sea goes on. And, and what I want to emphasize again is just the sheer amount of money and assets and resources that the U.S. is spending on this. And I'm not saying that from the perspective of we shouldn't be doing it. You know, the, it's a drop in the bucket compared to the effect on global trade mm -hmm. of having uh, this route uh, blocked off. But, you know, so just an example, I mean, um, on, on the 23rd, which happens to be my son's birthday, so I wasn't paying attention to this. Hey, get this, you know, this is a nice twist. Hey, the, the Houthis hit a Chinese... Um, uh, it was a Panamanian flag, but it was a Chinese-owned ship called the uh, Hong Pu. Okay, no D. I know you had fun with that name, not the Flung Pu, <laughs> um, the Hong Pu. All right, um, and it was they. So the Houthis threw four anti-ship ballistic missiles at it, um, and fortunately, those all missed, and then a fifth one hit it, suffered minimal damage. So. Uh, you, you know, that's not bad. At least now we're seeing some asymmetry in uh, the fact that Houthis are spending a lot of money to hit some aging mm -hmm. Chinese uh, ship. But anyway, be interesting to see the Chinese reaction to that. Ironically, U.S. Were, uh, you know, U U.S. is there to provide top cover for all of these ships to include those of China. Um, and, you know, the day before on Friday, there was this, another strike uh, into Yemen. I've lost track between the UK and the US of how many of these are. But when you look at the BDA, it's again, it's very modest, you know, uh, four UAVs destroyed on the ground. Well, all of us who've, who've, who've dealt with BDA know that, that, uh, that's, I mean, that's extraordinarily hard to prove, but four UAVs is not a huge amount of money. If you're going to send a bunch of F-35s, you know, on a strike mission, um, and for anyone, sorry, for anyone that asks, the BDA is the bomb damage assessment. Yeah, yeah, a absolutely. <clears throat> uh, thank you. So um, I'll pause there. See, uh, see any questions from you guys on, on the Red Sea? I got a question. The biggest yeah. question I have is like, where's the rest of the international community? Because this is an international waterway that yeah. brings billions and billions of dollars a year or more of product or whatever. Where's yeah, you, China? You, where's yeah. India? Where's... Egypt. You, you, you bring up a, uh, a great point here. Uh, D, D is our, um, you know, we we don't have political opinions, but D uh, is here very firmly rooted in MAGA land uh, from time to time and brings up. <laughs> and, and that is a great point, you know, I, and I'm, I'm not making fun of it. It's like we've got the same thing with NATO. Why, why the hell are we uh, now? Originally, we were the one of three countries. Um, uh, and now one of 11 who are even meeting NATO minimum requirements. And, the, and on not just the Red Sea, but all the maritime, global maritime commons, it is the United States that, that the world depends on to facilitate global trade, to include, as we've seen here with China, our adversaries. And it is what it is. The, you know, that's, and I, I will say we do it because it's in our national interest and because, um, in case you haven't noticed, while well, the global economy is going through some rough times right now with uh you know it, europe and china pondering whether they are indeed on the verge of a recession the united states economy is booming okay but it's booming because of the way we interact with global trade so for those who are adding up their pennies going i don't understand why we're defending it's because we made it we we united states our gdp profits incre uh disproportionately some might argue from global trade that is why we defend it okay this is so you know foreign policy 101 but i find myself in these arguments all the time why we do we have troops in the middle east you know do you know how much that costed that money money is money is one met just one measure of of uh one means of measuring and it's perhaps the the least um uh, the the least accurate, the least telling means of uh, of measuring effort um, mm. or, or return of investment, because money, quite literally, when it comes to this stuff, is relatively worth worthless when compared to uh, the continuity of global trade or sure. the effect of disruption of global trade.
So my whole point wasn't really like for us not to be doing it. Obviously, we should take the lead because we have more hardware than yeah. Most who countries. else is contributing besides um, the UK? I mean, like, listen, yeah. there are countries that it directly affects. Egypt being one, you know, I'm sure a ton of the Middle East company uh, countries because they uh, send Egypt, all their oil. Egypt, most of all, right? Egypt more than any other country. That's brilliant. that's my biggest I mean, thing. But, I'm not. But, I'm, not uh, but, I'm not saying that for like the for us not to be there. I think we need to be there of, for sure. It's, it's a question of capacity, not intent. It's a question mm -hmm. of capability. You know, the Egyptian Navy, uh, yes, they do indeed have a Navy, but it's, you know, it's it's not. Uh, and, and they, you know, I have to check to see if they're contributing. I'm pretty sure to the Red Sea, um, you know, there's a uh, coalition uh, escorting ships there. But the bottom line is this, that there is really only one or two countries, UK, US, uh, actually, there are several countries, but the the countries with the most proficient anti ballistic missile defense seaborne launched in the United States and the UK. No other country um, involved in that region has has that. Uh, Italy, France, don't. Not to the same extent. No one has sure. the SM. You know, I mean, people. Yeah, other countries had the SM too, but not in the same quantity i mean I'll, right. I'll just give you an example i mean so you know the navy releases i mean the navy's so proud of this and of course <laughs> it should be. um you know i mean they've i at last at last you know the thousand hundreds of thousands of rust chippers and guys who've never even seen the fucking ocean feel that they are really at war and the navy releases like a scorecard every day of you know drones and missiles shot down um uss carney always always leads okay 12 drones shot down in the last two days drones all missiles and then you know it's uss lahoon 10 uss mason 8 the gravely 4 and in last place the thomas hudner 2 okay new skipper kind of a lax crew um a lot of guys uh from a lot of guys from new york um, <laughs> <laughs> so Heavy drinking. All right. <laughs> hey, so I so, know we're keeping this tight, but go ahead. Quick question, and no. you you may not know the answer to this, but I'm wondering yeah. if you know how the fact that the Houthi shot the uh, shot at a Chinese uh, vessel. I'm wondering, do they know who they're shooting at? Like, is it just hey, we see something out there, let's shoot at it? Um, or? Yeah, yeah. Great question. So here was speculation for a while near the beginning that uh, I mean, no, what we do know. In the past, all right, in the past is that they have received intelligence from the Iranians. You know, so the, it isn't just that the Iranians, you know this, Jason, I'm, it's mm. for, and, and Dean knows it, but, it, you know, this isn't just about providing uh, missiles and weapon systems to the Houthis. It's also about on the ground mentoring, mm. um, not, not, not necessarily always in Yemen, but also back in Iran, okay? And, and this applies to to Hamas, the Iranians, as, as, as you know, run schools in country, um, and it's very easy to bring people back, train them, and then get them back out there. So they were relying on Iranian intelligence. Who knows now? Um, it does seem that there's very little rhyme and reason. They claim that every ship is supplying Israel in some way, but they've only hit one ship with any Israeli connections out of the 40 they've hit. And that had like an Israeli first officer, poor bastard. And they, there's no way they could have known that shit had an Israeli first yeah. officer. So they don't have great intel, um, but they're doing pretty damn well anyway, spotting these ships and, and gotcha. whacking them. You know, as I said, the U.S. Marine Corps would be very proud of this performance if it was against China in the Pacific. Mm. Gotcha. Cool. Thank you. All right. Uh, so moving on from uh, from the Red Sea. OK, on the on. Uh, but still in the Middle East, some things are happening vis-a-vis uh, -vis the pending invasion of uh, Rafa. And, and just for benefit of our listeners, so Rafa is uh, is is kind of the major conurbation in the south of the Gaza Strip near to the Egyptian border. And as the Israelis have moved from north to south, and we'll talk about this in some other class, uh, class some other, some other podcast. Um, they've done a very deliberate kind of uh, move to save, you know, really to to save their um, own casualties. Uh, but it was a very kind of 
predictable move. Um, and now they're poised around Rafa. Um, estimates vary, but probably one and a half million people crammed in very tiny space. United States is saying, you, you know, to Israel, to Netanyahu, you need to have a good plan to move the civilian population to beach the safety area. You know, it doesn't, that's not as grandiose as it sounds. Anyone who's mm -hmm. seen the beach at Gaza knows it's not the Côte d'Azur. But anyway, move them out of the conurbation to, to the uh, beach. The Israelis are saying, yeah, you know, this will happen. It'll be easy. They can walk. It's only 10 kilometers. They've already walked 40 kilometers. And, and uh, the, you know, the, the U.S. is, is, is remaining adamant. And, you know, there's a number of questions that I cannot answer right now how far this, you know, the administration is willing to go to put the squeeze on the uh, Netanyahu administration. But meanwhile, within Israel, um, I think it's fair to say that although the country is very much united behind the wall, uh, they just wish Netanyahu wasn't leading it. And a very there's some very interesting stuff happening in the IDF that I will write about um, culturally. OK, some of which led to, frankly, the, you know, the 7 October disaster and some of which now are contributing to problems within Gaza. OK, and, and I, I paused before talking about this until I until it started appearing in Israeli papers and it, and it has done as of today. Um, so two things have happened today. Um, well, one thing in particular, the general of a 98th Division, 98th Division commander, I'm sorry, 36th Division commander a guy named uh, Brigadier General uh, David Bar Khalifa. And uh, these names, generals names in Israel, are they're kind of like rock star. You mm. know, it's like Jack Murphy, you know, type uh, uh, adulation. Um, and, and it's because the, the country, I mean, it's uh, everyone's, everyone serves in the IDF and to the end, although <laughs> they're, you know, they have very volatile political governments, but the IDF remains a constant, a trusted, a trusted, Constant. And so one of the downsides, it is argued now, is that IDF commanders, some are letting things go to their heads and making decisions or comments that are political. Um, so the head of the 36 Armored Division, it's the only, you know, IDF's only armored division, main armored division in the active duty forces, and they've borne a lot of the, the brunt of the fighting. Before uh, the attack on Rafa, imminent attack on Rafa, he issues a handwritten battle directive to all of his troops that tell that calls on them to take revenge on Palestinians. Mm -hmm. Okay, not on Hamas, on Palestinians. All right, can you imagine a, a U.S. commander um, before going into flu just saying, hey, I want you to take revenge on Iraqis? Or, you know, um, you just can't imagine it, right? So what's happened is the, all his... Uh, the general staff have, have ordered him to, uh, um, to to pull his troops out of Gaza. So now, you know, now they're, they're down one division till they find out. And and the only reason why that happened is someone leaked this letter to the press, to Haaretz. Um, and then... Uh, Andy, why not, why not fire him? Exactly. Of exactly. You know how many IDF commanders have been fired so far in the war? Zero. Hmm. Well, not even subordinate. Not even subordinate commanders. There is. So I'm not making any comment on this. But can you imagine um, how many people? You know, I mean, it's just natural in Fallujah. We guys got fired because combat is the ultimate stressor, right? And you may have done very well as a as a junior officer, but now you're a captain leading a company in a slog fest fighting house by house not everyone you know a lot of guys can do very well in the military but yeah. when they're put in that situation they 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 don't do well they fall apart because it is very well to do to do a super job in the u.s military and retire as a colonel i know this or even a general <laughs> officer with while being a peeper tiger not being a warrior at all jason you've met many of these guys i Absolutely. would say perhaps the majority of u.s military officers are not warriors you know, I absolutely. Mean, it's just about the case. Anyway, my point is, I digress. But combat is a cruise, but they have not relieved a single officer, and there have been some serious mistakes. Okay, um, this one, last one was one, but you had a guy, um, a brigadier general, uh, Barack Haram uh, of the the uh, oh, I just trying to remember which division he has. It doesn't matter. But anyway, he's a, uh, a division commander, 
he no i'm sorry he's a battalion commander um in a fight for a kibbutz um it doesn't matter the name it, it, it may be nahalas but the hamas uh, 20 hamas terrorists bottom line took 12 hostages no 14 hostages into a building women children the idf surrounded them this guy ordered the idf supposedly allegedly to open fire on the house with a tank main gun okay everyone killed inside um the soldiers are saying that that he invoked what's called the hannibal directive uh which mm -hmm. is kind of a code red within the idf military um and when you when a commander orders that hannibal directive it just means kill everything in front of you even if there are well, this is how it's interpreted. The IDF denies that. The IDF says the Hannibal Directive simply means that you can heighten the risk to hostages in order to free them. Okay, but IDF commanders interpret it on the ground as meaning it's better to kill a soldier or a civilian than allow him to be taken hostage, which mm. is again, you know, so so this is so that's what this that's what the word is on the street that the Hannibal Directive has been invoked several times to include on seven October to allow uh, Israeli gunships to engage vehicles which had uh, Israeli hostages returning to Gaza. Okay, all I'm saying is that this is what is is within the public debate. It's not making it in the U.S. news, right? But it is a very serious debate. Okay, so after doing that, the same commander, um, uh, the the guy who leveled the house, he blew up Gaza University. All right, which ironically was built by the Israelis, funded by the Israelis. He blew it up without asking permission. Um, you may say that's great mission command, but come on, we all know uh, in a highly charged, sensitive situation, yeah. you're going to make a decision that's going to have clear str stratcom effects and blowing up the university <laughs> was one. Yeah. Um, then you need to tell your commanders because it was an appalling blunder when it comes to uh, perception, stratcom, you know, all of these things. And that's not all, okay? Um, there is a, a social media outlet that that the uh, Israeli papers have been, Jerusalem Post and Haaretz have been highlighting for a while. It's called 72 Virgins. So um, run from within the IDF at first, I thought it was something like, you know, remember the Marines one, Mm -hmm. um, but it's pretty sick stuff. It's on Telegram. I've seen it. You know, it's rejoicing in the death of, of um of people you know it's not you know the people that they're they're abusing bodies they're running over bodies with the vehicle everyone's standing around laughing um these are soldiers and uh and then they post them okay so that was bad enough uh people complained to the israeli army saying hey this is really fucking bad this makes us look awful um and it it just the Israeli army was like, yeah, we'll talk to the boys. But there's this ethos right now is you cannot discipline anyone within the army because they are fighting for our country and mm. they are taking, yeah. you know, so so no one did shit. And now turns out the IEF has admitted they were running the site. Can you I mean, can you believe that? The US Army running a site like that? No. Plus other influence operations um on on the Israeli public. Um, and the idea is like, hey, we just want to make people feel good. You know, it's like, holy shit. I, I mean, I get influence operations, but I don't know about like war crimes. No, crime no, TV. I mean, but but yeah. I'm, yeah, if you if you take a picture of a dead body or a prisoner in the U.S. military, all right, and, and try and publish it, you can forget about your career, everything. You may even go to jail. In most cases. Yeah. We've been, it's already been so, proven that some people do. Yeah. Um, so it, it just shows a huge lack of you know i mean well from a military perspective lack of discipline you know that that is not all um so another thing is various you know, i mean you know how tech savvy the israelis are startup nation so a lot of israeli citizens are saying we're tracking the movement of individual units within gaza based on social media posts now the idf is supposed to have collected up all their phones but evidently and the good units did as i checked but a lot of units did not. And mm -hmm. they, and so, by the way, that, that website's called 72 Virgins Uncensored. You can look it up, you can Google it, and you'll see the IDF admitted responsibility. It's still um, there, even though the IDF admitted it. I don't know. I didn't check. Uh, okay. I didn't check to morning. Um, but anyway, so so the, the, the Haaretz newspaper um, finally got involved again and said, you know, uh, the IDF hates Haaretz, you know. <laughs> but, 
and said, look, if they published the routes, you know, they say, or, or rather they showed the IDF. We, they said, we could publish this. It shows all the routes. It shows the positions of your units right now in Gaza. How do you think we got this? You know, and the IDF did what the US military was. Oh, someone leaked this shit. No, mm. it was all open source, mm -hmm. all open source. Yep. Okay. And that news broke again this morning that after two months of reporting to the IDF that they had this leak, they still haven't fixed it. And, and you can pinpoint units as they're staged around Gaza. Um, meanwhile, you know, the, uh, the, the Israelis um, recalled their negotiation, not the negotiation, their team um, for discussions of a potential ceasefire, uh, the team that was going to come to the U.S., all right? They recalled them mid-flight, pulled them back to Israel because Netanyahu was angry at the United States over its over our comments about, you know, Gaza and Rafa. Um, yeah, but didn't we abstain left. too from the UN security? Yeah, we we did, yeah. yeah, but that's, you know, it, yeah, that too. Um, and and what's bad is they left, Netanyahu left his defense minister, uh, Yov Gallant, right? He's he's on an early plane. This is why you should never be early. <laughs> so <laughs> he arrives and he gets a call going, hey, uh, no one else yeah, is coming. Yeah, we turned around. <laughs> yeah, you explain to our American friends why no one else is coming, you know. I've been in this situation many times. Oh, man, I can't even imagine what goes on, like, with the staff and stuff. Like, what do we do now? Yeah. Where do we go? Did yeah. they do a, didn't they do a meeting with Austin, Defense Secretary yeah. Austin? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they did. You Just know, to and, save, uh, you know, salvage and, it. Uh, like, Austin, oh, we're asking for F-15s, uh, we're asking for F-35s, which we'll probably give yeah. them. <laughs> well, you you know, I mean, Gallant, Gallant, however you pronounce his name, is um, he's pretty right wing himself. He's a you know settler, um, or you know, let me let me backtrack. He he certainly uh, sides with uh, all of that side, ultra orthodox, ultra religious. He's some of the, he's one of the ones who's made particularly inflammatory statements. So it's ironic that he's the one stuck here. Now we did read him the riot act, though, in the subsequent meeting, we told him, get this. Civilian casualties in Gaza, this is a quote, are far too high and aid deliveries far too low. That's what we told him. We cleaned his clock. Yeah, we did. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> so what happens, though, when they go into Rafa? I mean, humanitarian aid is going to be even lower. Um, well, here's what I think is going to happen. All right. I think that there is a lot of posture. I mean, not a lot. Um, the dynamic is a dangerous one because... 90 something percent i'm guessing the israeli population does indeed want to go in the the military in their words to finish the job finishing the job is part of the ids campaign plan going into rafa um netanyahu claims there are four battalions there western intelligence thinks there are more by the way they think that the um the israelis have overstated um attrition rates uh of uh, of hamas and in fact if you look up if you look up uh, the number of people killed in in Gaza, thirty two thousand, I believe now. But you look about at and the, uh, yes, I get it. This is the health authority within Gaza that's Hamas, Hamas control. But if you look how many of those, but but UN and the UK are coming up. I mean, sorry, UN and other aid agencies and the US are coming up with similar estimates. All right, mm -hmm. so thirty one thousand. Of those, approximately, how many do you think are uh, military age males? A third? Less than that. Okay. Less than a Nine. third. Less than a third. So the rest of the women, children, old people. All right. Um, so nine, so roughly 9,000. 9,000 men of military age. The Israelis claim they've, they've killed way more than that. All right. right. The Israelis claim, yeah, the Israelis claim they, you know, it, it varies, but 14, 15, up to 20,000. OK, so even if what I'm saying is even if every single military age male killed in Gaza was a member of Hamas, it still doesn't meet the numbers that the Israelis are saying that they killed. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and and then you factor in, as Jason knows, the just the difficulty in gathering intelligence, especially yeah. in an urban environment and fluid environment. We have small units moving back and forth and subterranean. You know, I mean, it's impossible to estimate it's very likely uh the best army army in the world with its numbers uh, for the adversary killed are going to be aspirational i know ours were in fallujah 
you know, we had no idea. We still can only make an estimate of how mm. many of the enemy we killed. Far too many escaped. Um, but yes, so a lot going on there. D, I know I brought us to, I mean, not, <laughs> not with my boring monologue, but I know we're coming to an end. So um, I got a question. Wait, any any last thing? Yeah, yeah. At what point does the U.S. like, instead of like giving them like a stern talking to, actually cut off military funding, actually do things that'll make them stop being this belligerent? Yeah, I. That's a really good question. Yeah, um, I don't think with this administration, I don't, no one. I don't think. I don't think the president can answer that right now. I think yeah. every day he's being taken down not taking down the path this isn't you know but it, i i don't think he he does understand that by the way everyone you know to preempt i know some of the complaints we're going to get that now you know i've before accused of being too pro israeli now anti no right. we're just stating facts right guys. i'm stating facts i'm stating what is in the the news and it's a, typically, when you have problems, cultural problems, I've talked about the U.S. military in mm -hmm. in much harsher terms, and we, you know, that's the way we do things here. It's not pro or con anything. We just, no, it's just the truth. We tell the story. Yeah. What is also like at what unspun, point unspun unspun world? At what point does that? Israel become like an international community? Like a pariah? My yeah, a pariah. Um. Yeah, that's a great point, but that is. What what is concerning, D, is and I, I, you know, I've been to Israel many times. Um, I'm I'm not, you know, not that this matters. I'm not Jewish, but I I just happen to have been there a lot, um, backpacking around there as a kid, all the way through to you know now. Um, and one thing that troubles me is that the atmosphere there is like nothing that I have experienced before. Nothing. Um, the the people. You know, I mean, it, it, Israelis normally super intelligent, super argumentative. You get different political views, five different political views in a, in a family, and they will argue and yell at each other, but then walk away. And that's the way it is. You right. know, politics is not a live wire there. Everyone talks about it, but no longer. It is really a very, um, they, they are all uh, backing the war. They are the ones who are queasy or, or and there are many who who don't like seeing it you know hearing about all these palestinian deaths but they all think that it is a necessary evil in order to get to security and bear in mind they aren't seeing what we're seeing israeli news is not showing the footage from gaza they're right seeing you know their own soldiers they um and and so they, they there's no discord they don't understand why the world is up in arms um and and they're getting increasingly resentful and increasingly re isolated, and it makes me it makes me sad. Yeah, I think from a for the world perspective, and this is not me speaking from the world, but it seems at least from my perspective is what is the end game? What is the objective? The objective is to you know ostensibly wipe out Hamas, but who and at what point says okay, we hit that objective, we're done? Because you're, it, this is a situation that is able to be kicked down the road in perpetual. It just can keep going. Oh, we didn't get it done yet. We didn't get it done yet. So where does it end, I think, is the world perspective. So I think to answer your question, but not answer it, when do they become a pariah? I think to some in the world, they already have. Yeah. And that's going to continue until and even after they say, OK, mission accomplished, we're done. Because yeah. what does mission accomplished look like? And what's the aftermath of that right that 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 is that yeah. is the 10 million dollar question and that that is going to already probably is causing rifts uh with you know in that nexus between political and and the military uh, there are many who within israel who are saying hey these you know the official goals of the war in gaza strip are dismantling hamas's military government capabilities bringing the hostages home restoring peace security to communities in the western negev right but it's hard to see that israel has has progressed anywhere along mm. those lines okay dismantling hamas's military think about the long-term effects Think about all the kids who are going to grow up. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it, having seen what they've seen, do you think you've really dismantled Hamas? Mm -hmm. I mean, I it, it just shows a, yeah. a, a total 
lack of an, of understanding of how insurgencies operate you know physical yeah. destruction oh yeah we just destroy them now there are those there are those who say hey in order to destroy hamas you have to you have to destroy the roots and the and the mm -hmm. roots are firmly embedded in the palestinian people that is the dog whisper comments that everyone is concerned about because mm -hmm. that is the acceptable justification right the acceptable for for wiping out the palestinians mm -hmm. okay i'm not saying that's the plan i'm saying that there are people on the far right who are saying that stuff within israel and it is and and what is concerning is the jump from that feeling of 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 normal just being concerned about security to yeah well if it's my family or that family i'm going to and that's the way the choice is being presented mm -hmm. very simply hamas is the palestinian people we wish it were otherwise i'm this isn't me talking hamas is the palestinian people you 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 can't separate them mm. you know it's very i'm i'm sorry but a lot of civilians are going to have to die to protect our civilians here and that i think you really have to understand is that the survival of the jewish state the survival of the jewish people um is is core obviously to you know to i mean to the state of israel i mean that it, that's what zionism mm -hmm. is 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 about and um again that's you have to understand that to understand almost this the ends justifies the means uh mentality the, the, it's people it's people who like you and me think they are being absolutely logical and ethical um with horrific results and now you can think back to the, okay, you go here, I better not make this comparison. I'm not making comparison. 30s in Germany, you could understand that. Humiliation of the First World War, but not really feeling they were defeated, right? They were never really invaded. You know, they, they, the armistice was signed while well, German troops were still on French soil. Huge unemployment, um, where it was felt that the Jewish bankers were taking um, we're getting rich while the majority of Germans were struggling to survive. And then you get this charismatic war hero who doesn't represent the Hitler, by the way. <laughs> yeah, he was. He was a charismatic war hero, good speaker. And he rises up. Um, and in a, it's still democratic society. People are pissed off with the Weimar Republic, which they see as corrupt and venal. Um, and, and he offers a new future. And is, you know, yeah, I mean, you can hang around about whether he's democratically elected or not, but at least the trappings of democratic election were there. Um, and so, you know, the, these para, and everyone said at the time, I don't believe this is the German people. I don't believe this is the country of Beethoven. And, uh, it, you know, you know, I'm not searching for German culture here. I'm just saying that. Um, it just seemed so, so it can happen you know, confronted with the right circumstances, a society that is deeply cultured and intelligent and sophisticated can do barbaric things. And just to, you know, just to balance that out, you can look at the other side of that, the far left side of that, those who support, you know, Gaza slash Hamas, um, they're looking at everything Andy just said as justification for another October 7th or why That's October right. 7th That's happened right. in the in the first place. So it's just a perpetual yeah. cycle. That's right. just going to go round and round. That, that's right. And you got to understand um, from the Palestinian perspective, and we have to look at it from both perspectives. Can you imagine growing up and every time you want to get somewhere, you've got to go through an Israeli checkpoint and they're searching your shit. They're making comments about your sister. You know, they, I mean, you know how soldiers are all of the, and occasionally you get beaten up. It's not unheard of for Israelis simply to to shoot people, you know, thinking, because as long as they say, and they, if they say they're under threat or they feel under threat, that is kind of the benchmark. Now, I'm saying that not as an anti-Israeli thing. We've done the same thing in our own military. Hey, hey, Marine, if you feel under threat, you know, best to pull the trigger. And then we started realizing we were killing a lot of civilians every day. And one estimate in Mosul, five civilians killed every day at checkpoints by soldiers. Five civilians every day by U.S. soldiers. All right. And and of course, that seems to counter counter. Not a, not a single, not a single one 
was brought up on charges. You know why? Because their commanders had told them, hey, man, you did the right things. Better safe than sorry. No, it's not fucking better safe than sorry in a counterinsurgency. There are pragmatic as well as ethical reasons. But most of all, and I'll return to the fact, and I've said this to Israelis, to Americans, we fight with the values that we represent. We don't bring the adopt those of our enemy. If we do, it, it will be tremendously weak and we need to suffer the consequences. And we don't belong in the U.S. military. I've, again, I've always said that. If you if you can't be a leader and lead in the right way, get the fuck out of the military. Exactly. Right? If you want to if if you want to beat your chest and and fulfill all your ridiculous backwards deliverance fantasies, then then do that. Join a militia and do it, but don't join our military. Absolutely. And I think um, the IDF is having some cultural issues too. Yeah. And you 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 made it uh, when you mentioned like like you know you're a Palestinian you're walking through uh, Israeli checkpoints every day, your friends gotten shot they hit on your sister, yeah, I mean I could see if I lived there I'd be in fucking Hamas too. Would you kill? Of course I yeah. kill. Of yeah. course, and, and any human being who thinks that they can't reach that level of anger is fooling themselves. Absolutely, right. and the same goes for that. Is that IDF soldier? And that, no, that I'm not justifying terrorism. I'm absolutely I'm talking about human nature. Right, absolutely human nature. Yeah, before anyone too. complains, same thing on the military. Exactly, Jason. If you yeah, grew up, that, that kid uh, who's walking Israeli through, kid, yeah, they, exactly. If you're growing up and you've and you've seen, and and they the Israelis became addicted to the Telegram videos of the massacres. So can you imagine reeling through that, reeling through that in a way? that no previous war did it. I mean, yes, there was anti-German propaganda, but there weren't spooling videos of right. Germans crucifying kittens on church doorways, you know. Um, so it's very dangerous. And that is why leadership is all important. And when you have a division commander issuing a handwritten note on top of all that shit saying, hey, your mission is to exact revenge. Not, not hey, you're, it's okay to do that. Your mission is to exact revenge on the Palestinians. That reminds me of Captain Medina's order to his company, um, of which Lieutenant Kelly's second platoon was part, yep. um, which led yeah, to the Eli massacre. Captain yep. Medina said, you do, you, you know, when you go in there, you think anything's wrong, you just fucking destroy it. Words yep. to that effect. Mm -hmm. Kelly repeated them afterwards. Yep. Words fucking do matter in an order. <laughs> so right. Um, but yes, very strange. They they took him and his soldiers out of Gaza instead of saying, "Okay, dude, fuck off." You know, go to the IDF retirement home. We're gonna. So they moved an entire division outside of Gaza. Isn't that like important? I don't listen. I I don't want to misspeak. I, it's just reported. I'm I'm going off what's reported in Haaretz Jerusalem Post. Um, the exact terms are his true. Um, oh shit! Hold it. Um, blah, 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 blah. I don't know. I he it said. His uh, his troops, yeah. It doesn't matter. He It wasn't him alone. It probably is yeah. division headquarters. I would guess that's probably what they mean. You know how civilians report stuff. They're not going to remove an entire division out just because... Right, that's what I was going to... Yeah, idiot. that sounds but probably insane. his headquarters, yeah, because they're all tainted. But a division headquarters is a big deal. That's a big the deal. Israelis can only feel three at any given time. So if you're removing one, you know, and they have to have one standing by for the north, Right. Um, and at uh, usually they've had one to two headquarters, division headquarters operating within Gaza. Um, it's difficult to assess numbers, but at the height of the campaign, they had around 30,000 guys. But you can't simply say, oh, that's, you know, two divisions or three divisions because of the way they put units together. They'll have a division headquarters above two brigades here and then above four brigades there. But roughly 30K troops which puts their casualty figures below ours in Fallujah when you when you factor in per capita, when you factor in um, all the other things. So of course, we had tremendously less supporting arms, mm. uh, ironically, um, in Fallujah than they do. Uh, but we lost more people mm. um, because that's what, you know, the U.S. made that decision. I mean, yes, we destroyed what we had to. Uh, but we certainly didn't prep buildings before we went in. Um, we couldn't. And um, I don't regret that. I've got nothing on my conscience. Yeah, we, it was a hard slog, but uh, I didn't, you know, I never went into a house and found dead civilians. Um, and I'm good with that. Awesome. All right. That's the show.
I love it. Spicy. It's very spicy, man. <laughs> I right. mean, but we're not that. We're not getting that crazy. Be like we we're just calling it down the line. Like it's no what one's it is. taking their shirt off. That's true. no one's no one's drinking and That's attacking, true. say the Ukrainian government. <laughs> so we'll okay. be okay. Or making comments, yeah. And if uh, if um, Max, uh, what was that guy's name? The um, Blumenthal. Russian... Yeah, Blumenthal. Yeah, if he's watching, um, yeah, good luck to him. Good yeah, luck, Max. Repost thank this, you. Max. It's fine. We'll, we're happy. Yeah, with you. thank you for all you've done for Russia. Okay. <laughs> he is, man. I mean, okay. All, all right. On that note, bye, everyone. No, wait. In a couple of days. Like and subscribe. Oh, oh. oh yeah. And, Andy's fired up. Like and subscribe. If you're listening to us on audio, rate and review at five stars. It's very, very important. Check out Andy on Twitter, Substack, and his book. It's all links are in the description. And uh, Please our Patreon. Buy my book. It's Please awesome. buy his book. And I read it, is, it myself on audio. It's very good. I've read it. It's very good. Uh, okay. And the patreon.com slash the team house. Thank you. All right. All right. Thanks, everybody. See you in a couple of days.